Hi there. You're listening to The Everglade Chronicles, a reading. I'm Garrett Shave, the author. Happy Halloween! I hope you have a spooktacular day, and your Halloween is filled with ghoulish delight and plenty of candy. This week, I am reading Chapter 2, The King is Dead, Long Live the King. Now let's get started. Boo! Friday evening was an interesting night. The pathways were lit with lanterns provided by the city, and children were gathering in their masses. It was near mandatory that we all be here in the royal city to attend the last day of school gala. It was considered the pinnacle of the Meadows events, aside from the usual celebrations to end the season, and a signifier that summer had arrived. I stood near my friends and those of the forest. I did not trust anyone else. I looked around at the massive gathering of children and noticed a few familiar faces. Those of Sunset, including Duke Daniel and his small entourage, were there. The thrones had been brought down with care from their high places, arranged nicely before the audience. This was a routine Everglade custom. I stared at the two empty wicker chairs. One was slightly larger than the other, but there was no mistake. They were definitely wicker chairs from someone's patio. The larger one was draped with a red velvet table runner which ran from the back of the chair all the way down the middle and dangled above the grass. The smaller one was bare. I wondered why it needed to even be here since Queen Diana was no longer around. The king's attendant was standing astutely near the thrones. He was gangly looking, straw thin, with a large honker of a nose. He had sad eyes and his small mouth was often in a frown. The boy's hair was jet back and slicked back, and he stood with his arms behind his back like a true butler. His name was Cornelius, but in real life he was Connor Polov. His dark cobalt eyes met mine, but he gave no inclination that he actually saw me. I had met him a few times since the stewards and attendants were often forced to mingle at royal events. I wonder if the new king will accept Cornelius as their attendant, I asked Alex. She was standing near, sipping iced tea that was being dispensed from a cooler. A few people were drinking cans of root beer and cola. Probably, Alex answered. Cornelius is a piece of furniture. He comes with the role. He has attended upon Titan his entire reign and also his predecessor. A herald came skidding down the hill, his small red cape flapping in the wind like a magic carpet. He was moving too quickly and had to stop abruptly lest he trip and fall. I watched as he spoke with Cornelius briefly. He whipped out his small plastic bugle and began trumpeting away. Attention, attention, his premature voice rang out loud and high. I wish to present the nobles of the realm. This was the grandest show of all, the nobles descending and then ascending to their place next to the throne and the king. It was an age-old custom that predated my time in the meadow and would continue into the future. There was a mixture of nobles that came floating down the hill, wearing their Sunday best. It was like magnificent parade. The first was the Lord Chancellor, followed by Lady Verinder, Lady Diamond, and Lord Cody of Cloverleaf. The two ladies wore summery dresses of blue and yellow, matched with tiaras in their hair. Cody and Kratos wore simple outfits of plaid and denim, with Halloween capes and fake crowns. Lastly, now the royals and the highest nobility would step down the hill. The trumpet went up again, and, f and the first to descend were the Dukes of Sunset and the Lost Forest. Finally, the royals arrived, and Prince Justin and Crown Prince Thomas descended into our midst. None of them looked impressed. They both actually looked worried. Attention, Kratos called, stepping forward. He was wearing a large green fleece bathrobe and carried with him a garden scepter. It had a golden iron sun on the top. He reminded me of a wizard. Let us all sink into a deep bow as his majesty arrives. Anyone caught out of order will be executed. I swallowed hard. This always happened at these events. The nobles positioned themselves along the dais near the throne, with the most important standing near the king's chair. Duke Castor wore a look of concern. Both he and the duchess were wearing crowns made of woven flowers and bark. These were a type of forest crown worn to foreign events to denote status and power. I kept my eyes on the hill as the king came down. He was escorted by four guards in the front and four at the rear. 
All of them were tall and burly, carrying Halloween axes and halberds. Jonathan Rosewood had grown over the past year, and I could tell he was slowly entering adulthood. He was on the cusp of the portal void, ready to jump. He had grown taller, much taller, and aspects of his very apparent age were written on his face. He had pronounced stubble, bright blue eyes, and blackish hair spiked into a faux hawk. He wore purple and white plaid and denim, like any other boy here tonight. Upon his pimply face, he sported a look of relaxed observation. I could feel the negativity radiating from him, as if he thought this entire gala was pointless. I suppose to him, it really was. The king stood near his brothers, with whom he only gave a microscopic nod of approval. He towered over them, like a giraffe compared to a lion. Prince Justin stood behind the throne, while Thomas took a seat on Queen Diana's former chair. The rest seemed to slide into the background, with the king and his small royal family on display like perfectly positioned ornate figurines in a diorama. We, the spectators, all sunk into bows. It was tradition for the lost forest dwellers to only bow from the stomach, gently forward. In doing so, we could see the expressions. We could see what they were doing up there on the dais. The rest were sunk into the ground, almost groveling in front of the divine royals, and distracted by dirt. If you aren't kissing the grass, you aren't giving the king proper respect was an old rosewood proverb. Thank you for coming, Titan's words were short. He spoke with a deep, hoarse voice. I could tell he no longer cared. He had lost the strength in his voice. You may all rise. I stared at Thomas, who was gazing out at the sea of children assembled here. He looked extremely uncomfortable. His right leg was tapping violently against the ground in anticipation. He was also biting his lip. This gave me an opportunity to study his appearance, since the fabled crown prince was so sheltered at King's Summit. He looked like Jonathan, who looked like Justin. Yet the other two were more attractive. Thomas had a round face, and made more round by his obscure bowl haircut. His hair was brown, but his eyes were a cool blue. They were a striking contrast to Titan's sharp, jagged, light blue eyes. Justin was the most handsome one. He had nice, glossy brown hair one might describe as almost auburn. It was almost purposefully styled. His eyes were the same as Titan's, and many of the girls went wild for those hypnotic, crystalline shards. The king waved his hand dismissively, and both Kratos and Cornelius stood forth. The Lord Chancellor retrieved some sort of rolled-up scroll from his immense folds and opened it. The scroll looked important and made of fine papyrus. He cleared his throat. It is with great sorrow that we announce the abdication of His Majesty King Titan. His words were dry and filled with dread. For once, the omnipotent Lord Kratos was having problems delivering lines. Titan has served this meadow for a great number of seasons, but he wishes to pass the baton forth to a new generation of rosewood heirs. I am now bound by the divine will of King Titan to proclaim Thomas Rosewood as our new sovereign to be anointed and crowned in due course. I now ask for your applause for the new King Thomas. God save the king, as one might say, Cornelius inserted awkwardly. We were forced to clap, but none of us wanted to. The dukes were looking anxious, and the senseless nobles looked unimpressed. Titan looked the most bothered. I could tell he wanted to be anywhere else but here. He looked squeamish, like this was all so juvenile. I studied his face and the faces of the others. I knew something was going to change and that this was not the change that was needed. The evening was spent in dull conversation. The children were actively buzzing about their new sovereign and what it would mean for the kingdom. Thomas had a legacy to fulfill and had a lot to live up to. While his brother might have been gone, he was now the king. They were expected to act a certain way, and I was positive that Thomas would fall into line like the other Rosewood monarchs. He would be as evil as them. The inner evil was still stewing and fermenting. I decided to go and speak with Cornelius to see what his take on all of this was. He was standing astutely near the empty throne with hardly anyone else around. 
The king had gone, as had Titan. Titan, now a spirit, a wraith destined to wander the adult lands. Prince Justin was somewhere in the crowd schmoozing. The only other person nearby was Lady Verinder, and she looked blank. You must be thrilled, I said to Cornelius as I approached. Another king to serve. You must feel proud. The future looks uncertain, he replied quietly. This is not what the majority want. Is that so? I pondered. I'm sure Thomas will make a great king. We wanted Justin, Lady Verinder perked up randomly. She must have overheard us speaking. I gave her a quick bow as it befitted her status. Thomas has not the will to lead nor to rule. I am unfamiliar with the dynamics of King's Summit, I told her. However, it seems clear that change was necessary. Verinder nodded. Her real name was Megan Chive, yes, like the Onion. She was thirteen and wore a stoic look. Her lips were often lathered in rouge, and her hair was straight cut in black. Her eyes were a mysterious shade of jade green. King Titan lost his flair for the game a while ago, she told me. Megan was always more helpful than the others. She had a fondness for saying too much and often said things that she was not supposed to. It was discussed as early as March that he might leave the game, but we must do so formally. All the former Rosewood rulers left the game with dignity. Makes sense, I replied, rubbing my chin. Why not make Justin the king if Thomas is so disliked amongst you royals and nobles? Order of precedence, Cornelius inserted. Thomas is older and therefore the heir. Such is the way things are done in a monarchy. Regrettably so, Lady Verinder finished. We could not speak more on the topic, for Lord Kratos approached us. Alex had come to find me, but we were caught off guard with the Lord Chancellor arriving. Why are you all lingering near the thrones? He asked us rather rudely, almost as if he had come to shoo us away. I exchanged glances with his attendant, Heather, who appeared sympathetic. Merely chatting, my lord, Lady Verinder said, staring at him intently. Is there an issue with that? Just seems a bit unusual. Think nothing of it, my lord, Lady Verinder snapped. There is no problem unless you create one for yourself. I do not think King Thomas would appreciate you harassing the gentry for simply conversing in front of the thrones on the first night of his kingship. I smiled victoriously as Kratos slunk away like a weasel. I was surprised that Megan had come to our aid. I looked over at Alex and we excused ourselves. We stopped near some of the bushes and trees, away from all the action. What were you doing speaking with Cornelius and Lady Verinder? Alex asked, a little surprised. I wanted to ask Cornelius's take on the whole thing, I said. Lady Verinder just happened to be standing nearby. She said the nobles are not happy with our new monarch. She always has been known to spill more beans than necessary, Alex mused. It does not surprise me that those pompous idiots are already unhappy. I agree. They all want Justin, but Thomas is older. Any word on when Thomas will be crowned? I can only assume we will be present for that ceremony as well, she sighed. No one seems to know right now. It will likely be very soon. Verinder told me that Titan has been wanting to abdicate since March. He has been itching to leave. How interesting, Alex said, smiling at me. Perhaps we should get back to the party and see if we can find out more information. We both nodded and strolled back to the gala. I walked around the meadow party and gazed for a while. I watched a few conversations unfold and simply enjoyed myself. The lights on the posts lent a warm glow to the air. It was beginning to darken and some children were leaving. I found Gabrielle speaking with none other than the new king. Oh, Gabrielle said with a big smile when she saw me. This is Caitlin Hardy. She is a steward for his grace. A pleasure to finally meet you, Thomas said. His voice was presumably meek. I have an appreciation for the gentry. You all do so much for us. I bowed deeply. Nice to meet you as well, your majesty. I said, catching Alex out of the corner of my eye. I waved over to her. This is Alexandra. I introduced her. We just call her Alex, but she lives in the Lost Forest. Mademoiselle, the king said, kissing her hand. Alex giggled like the schoolgirl she was. What were you two discussing, I asked, a little taken aback by what I had just witnessed. I desperately wanted to steer the conversation away from that. The kingdom, of course, Thomas sighed. There is much to be done, to fix things. 
I couldn't agree more, Alex said, a sharp inclination in her voice. Something was at work in her tone. Do you have any plans for the betterment of the meadow? Gabrielle asked him. So many kids seemed to be unhappy. Thomas was quiet and went red. I was trying not to giggle at his indecisiveness. Nothing right now, I suppose, he stammered. It is all so technical, what with the coronation coming up, reassignment of tasks, oaths of fealty. He was staring at the ground now, uncertain of what more to say. A moment of silence dragged into minutes. We should be going, Alex said abruptly, motioning us to leave. The Duke and Duchess will be expecting us. We bid farewell to the fumbled King Thomas and departed for our home. It was just the three of us now, strolling in the moonlight towards the lost forest. We walked three abreast, like cowboys marching to face an outlaw for a duel in the town square. We were on the eastern gravel path, along the river's brim. The only sounds were the remaining children having fun back at the royal city, and the gravel crunching under our feet. "'What did you make of Thomas?' I asked Gabrielle. She had been awfully quiet since we began walking home. She seemed distant, too, keeping her brown eyes studied on the gravel. Fine, she was brief. He was nervous. I expected that. I certainly was expecting more, Alex added rather sourly. I could tell she was trying to upset Gabrielle, and I could not help but smirk. He came off as the shy, timid loser I had heard about. That's really unfair of you, Alex, Gabrielle chided. Would you not be nervous on your first night as king? His brother practically abandoned the meadow. I think there is a lot more going on at King's Summit than we know, Gabby, Alex retorted. Gabrielle stopped and stared at her. I suppose I cannot deny that, but I must come to his aid. He is still new. He hasn't learned how to be a king yet. Even better, I guffawed sarcastically. So, he is supposed to be the heir and learning how to govern, and then when he finally does get the crown, this is who we receive? He hasn't been taught a thing. Alex nodded. I must agree with Caitlin there. Both of you, be quiet, Gabrielle stated loudly. The frustration in her voice was volcanic. You do not know him. That is all that I will say further on this matter. You two do not know him. Before we could respond, the little pixie girl darted into the bush. There was some rustling and then she was gone. The future duchess had left us out on the gravel path. That concludes chapter two, The King is Dead, Long Live the King. Thomas now sits the throne. Will he be just like Titan? Next week, I will be reading the rather short chapter three, Something Must Change, and also chapter four, Life at Court. Happy Halloween, everybody, and see you next week. Music for the podcast is A Space Journey by Hartsman. You can find all the Chronicles of Everglade novels exclusively on Amazon. And check out my latest novel, The Train to Dranmore, which is also on Amazon. Find us on Instagram and Facebook as well, at The Everglade Chronicles. Thanks for reading, and thank you for your support. See you next time!